So hello, welcome to the video and welcome to Singapore and welcome to what is probably the longest day of my life. I'm flying today all the way from here in Singapore to New York's JFK Airport on the world's longest commercial flight, 9,537 miles. This has been on my aviation to-do list for absolutely ages and I'm really excited that the day has finally come but I have to say I'm also a little apprehensive because 18 hours is a really, really long time. I think I've got enough to entertain myself and I'm certainly ambitious of getting a decent kit on this plane but it is still a very, very long way. But I have been on a plane for longer than I'm expecting to be today. I was on Qatar Airways' longest Q-suite flight last year and we had a medical diversion which added four or five hours to our flight time, meaning I was on that plane and in that seat for over 21 hours. So I do have some experience of what sitting in a seat for a very long time feels like. And I say it's going to be my longest day. We're crossing the date line, so it's quite a peculiar flight to get your head around, so to speak. We take off at about one in the afternoon and land at five in the afternoon the same day. We cross the date line so we restart the day, although there's a 13 hour time difference between Singapore and New York. So when I go to bed later today in New York, it'll still be Thursday, although I won't be going to bed for 28 or perhaps 29 hours. It is really, really hard to keep track of. And although I'm travelling business class on one of the world's best airlines in one of the world's best business class products, I think you'll be surprised at how little I've actually paid for this experience. So if you'd like to see what the experience is like and what I paid for it, you'd better stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.4 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So subscribe to see where I go next and perhaps get some inspiration for your next trip. Changi Airport is a bit bigger now than it was when I lived in Singapore. It now has four terminals. I departed from Terminal 3, from which the Jewel was just a little too far away to pop into. It was really quiet in the check-in area of this large terminal. I was already checked in, as this was a continuation of my previous day's flight from Bangkok, but I passed by the check-in area nevertheless. It was late morning and it was really, really quiet. I was selected for a random bag scan, but Singapore's Changi Airport is unusual in that the main baggage scanning is done at the gate rather than at the entrance to the departure area. Probably something to do with arriving and departing passengers being co-mingled. There's still an automated passport check though to get into the departure zone, but I was quickly through. Changi Airport really is something else. You could spend days in the departure zone and not run out of things to see and do. You can also move between terminals and one inter-terminal train will actually pass through the Jewel even if you can't stop there airside. I was mainly interested in checking out the lounge situation, but I couldn't resist a few minutes in the butterfly garden. Like the lounges in Doha, the lounge naming convention in Singapore has the potential to be confusing. The Chris Flyer Gold Lounge is available to Star Alliance status holders, which I guess makes sense. But the Better Lounge, which is available to people actually travelling in Singapore's premium cabins, is called the Silver Chris Lounge. I haven't recently checked commodity pricing, but I think gold is still a more valuable metal than silver. Although in Singapore at least, the silver lounge is more valuable than the gold one. There's a dedicated lounge for first class travellers to the left, but I was directed to the business class lounge to the right, which was really nice. There was a large, light and airy space to the right on entry, which had some views and also some wildlife to entertain you. There were food and beverage stations in that area, although at that time of day, none were open. Through the other side of the lounge complex was a more enclosed space, still very large and comfortable, with lots of different seating options. The food and beverage options were superb, buffet style for the food with lots of hot and cold options. It was late morning when I passed through and more western breakfast options were available around the corner. Not an exhaustive drinks list, but premium brands were available if you fancied a cognac at 11am. I believe the manned bar opens in the other section of the lounge later on. I skipped the cognac, but I did enjoy a glass of Tattinger. Cheers.
It really was an excellent lounge. It's reportedly even better in the first class section, but Singapore's business lounge benchmarked really well against any other business lounge I've visited, and also rated well against many first class lounges. Time to head to the plane, and it was a long walk. My gate was actually the far side of the duel, if you remember how far away it was from that earlier shot. I also mentioned earlier that Singapore operates its security checks at the gate rather than at the entry point to the departure area. That can be a bit of a pain when boarding some busy flights, but our plane was a five-year-old Airbus A350-900 series with Singapore's ultra-long-haul configuration. That fits in just 161 passengers, so having security checks at the gate wasn't a problem. Leisure airline French B fits in 411 passengers into the same airframe, two and a half times as many. Singapore's ultra-long-haul passengers are split across two cabins, business and premium economy. This is done to reduce the weight of the aircraft so it can span this huge distance and to create a more comfortable and spacious environment for the passengers to survive the journey. Premium economy on this plane is 38 inches of seat pitch, which would still be a challenge for an 18-hour flight, but it is better than the 32 inches you'd get on French B. Boarding was already underway and it didn't take long with so few passengers and onto the plane. The same seats as I'd experienced the day prior on the flight down from Bangkok, but this version of the A350 has two business cabins which extend beyond the wing with the premium economy cabin behind. I was in the second row of the second cabin. And as I said in the previous video, there's a lot of seat. In front of you is a large entertainment screen. A decent sized storage bin is to the side with a drink shelf and a mirror. I'll come back to that somewhat odd foot cubby, but there was a literature slot and another storage compartment which contained a bottle of water plus the headphones. Another storage zone over your shoulder, a light and the power points including an HDMI port which some people might find handy. The tray table rises from beside you and on the other side are the seat controls. Behind you, set within the seat shell, are three more lights which cover the various recline positions, but no overhead air vents, just a couple more lights. One thing I really liked was that the seat was not cluttered with bedding and stuff that you immediately need to store somewhere. Your bedding is stored down the back of the seat. This shot might give you a clue as to one of the seat's major shortcomings. There's a cushion slash pillow on the seat, and this shot reveals the seat's other major shortcoming. There's limited space to stretch out your feet in the seated position as the foot cubby is offset. The seat back is square to the seat wall in front of you, so if you want to relax with your feet up, it's really uncomfortable as you end up having to twist in the seat to point your feet at the cubby. There was though a very handy area under the foot cubby where you could store a small bag, really quite a handy feature. A comprehensive menu book was at the seat, which included the menu for the return flight, which accounted for some of the girth. Page one illustrated a quirk of Singapore Air that I actually approve of. There's no amenity kit provided on every seat. Instead, a wide range of amenities are available, either in the bathrooms or from the flight attendants. I wouldn't be shocked if 90% of amenity kits and their contents end up in landfill. So even though it is fun to receive them, I think offering stuff on demand is a smart approach that will catch on. I requested socks and got some slippers thrown in too. A pre-departure beverage duly arrived. Champagne for me. A cheers. We pushed back pretty much on time and taxied past a beautiful A380 sandwich. And we took off on the world's longest flight. So let me explore what that actually means. Out of all non-stop scheduled services, Singapore to JFK in New York has the furthest great circle distance between them, 9,537 miles to be precise, three miles further than Singapore to Newark, which is also serviced by Singapore Airlines. There has been a longer commercial flight. Air Tahiti Nui ran a repatriation flight right at the start of the You Know What that was so lightly loaded that they were able to fly non-stop from Papiete to Paris, skipping the usual stop in LA. That flight was 200 miles further than Singapore to New York at 9,765 miles. But 
The keen-eyed among you will have noticed that the Great Circle route between Singapore and New York spends a lot of time in Russian airspace. Since Putin lost his mind and invaded lovely Ukraine, many airlines, including Singapore Air, have avoided Russian airspace. So we had to take a longer route south of Russian airspace, which took us south of Japan and up across Alaska and over Canada. It looks shorter on a map, but the peculiarities of traversing the surface of a globe meant this added 9% to the distance flown. That meant we actually flew 16,734 kilometres, which is 10,398 miles, longer than Air Tahiti Nui's longest flight. Now, in 2017, Qantas initiated Project Sunrise, a programme to develop a product that could fly non-stop from London to Sydney. This has been delayed a bit because of the you-know-what, but the first non-stop flight on this route is expected to take place in 2025. Significant work is being done on how to configure an airplane that can cover the outrageous distance between London and Sydney. There's talk of building special lounges, designing special seats, even putting wellness zones on the plane where passengers can stretch and even do yoga. But London to Sydney is 10,573 miles, which is only 175 miles further than I flew on this flight. My flight was further than London to either Brisbane or Adelaide. And we still went very north. Other flights I've checked on flight radar stay much further south, which increases the flight distance even more. Wikipedia suggests the distance covered is often around 10,700 miles. So it's going to have taken Qantas eight years to work out how to do something that Singapore Airlines is already doing. But is Singapore Airlines doing it right? Well, I'm not sure they are. Things started well though, although my decision to start with a Singapore sling only served to remind me that I don't really like Singapore slings. A bit too sickly for me. Served with some warm nuts. The table was duly laid and we kicked off with a scallop starter, beautifully presented, served with some wine and it tasted as good as it looked. When you fly out of Singapore, you have the opportunity to book the cook through which you have access to an extensive list of meal options way beyond what could be provisioned on board. It's a really extensive list. I'd gone for a sea bass, which might not have looked the best, but again it was delicious. I don't love watching videos of other people eating, so I'll distract your attention by using this footage to illustrate how the seat is quite open to the aisle and offers relatively little privacy. I'm not a big dessert eater, so I went for the cheese. Tasty, although offering the crackers in plastic wrapping wasn't a hugely premium look. It was all really very good. Those of you following along will know that this flight was part of a round the world in eight days challenge that I'd set myself. I'd only had about 15 hours in Singapore and was already jet lagged when I got there. I didn't sleep very well before this flight and I dragged myself up at 6am to be able to see the city for a couple of hours before leaving for the airport. So once this rich meal was cleared and the lights were dimmed, I just wanted to go to sleep. I also thought it was a smart thing to do as it put my body clock much closer to New York time. I find it helpful to try and get into the arrival time zone whilst I'm still on the plane. But unfortunately, this took me out of sync with the somewhat rigid service schedule Singapore offered. More on that later, but for now, it was time for bed mode. I hinted that the seat design was odd as it offered so little recline and the major shortcoming of the seat quickly became clear. The seat converts into a bed by flipping forwards rather than from reclining back. The only other seat that converts this way that I know of is Virgin's old upper class seat and it is widely hated for that and other reasons. I didn't manage to film the seat's conversion into a bed but I needed to exit the seat and stand to one side whilst the crew converted it. In bed mode, the foot cubby made a little more sense, and the bed was long enough, even if it's a little cramped around the shins. No pyjamas, which I think he might have expected on a flight like this, but the bedding was nice enough, and I slept pretty soundly for six hours. I did manage to film the conversion of the bed back into a seat. I didn't like it, and I have to question why Singapore chose it. The flip forward conversion is really inconvenient and limits the recline in seat mode and having the foot cubby offset like that is just daft and makes the seat actually quite uncomfortable if you are taller and want to just stretch your legs out. Okay. 
I'd actually been woken up by the crew as I'd not thought to put the Do Not Disturb light on, and minutes after waking from a six hour sleep I was presented with an oily plate of chicken satay, which was somewhat nauseating and I wasn't even remotely hungry, so I declined it. Hello! Now I will readily concede that from this point on my desire to deviate from the appointed Singapore Airlines schedule was the root cause of my problems. Unlike Qatar Airways and some other airlines that let you eat what you want when you want, Singapore struggles to accommodate you if your body clock doesn't put you on the same schedule as their mandated service programme. That schedule mandated that you have a really heavy three-course meal, wait about seven hours, then have another really heavy three-course meal. Then there'll still be another nine or so hours to run before you arrive into New York at 5pm local time. But no third meal is offered except for snacks and the like. There's certainly no breakfast before you arrive. Given there was a 13 hour time difference and we crossed the dateline mid-flight, everybody on the plane that Thursday ended up having a 37 hour day. It was the longest day of my life, as I said in my intro. Singapore Airlines took this all very, very literally and catered the flight as if it was one really long day. But that ignored the reality of crossing the dateline, which meant there actually was a sunset and a sunrise during our flight. So in my mind that meant we experienced two very short days rather than one very very long one and I'd sort of mentally prepared for the flight according to that schedule. So after declining the chicken satay I asked if I could eat in about four hours time and the crew said that was fine and I spent that time doing some work. One further huge positive about this flight is that Wi-Fi was free for business class passengers for the entire duration. And it was a great quality connection too. This was the speed I was getting in the middle of the Bering Sea. The crew was excellent and did their very best to accommodate me. And about four hours later, a starter was delivered, a crab salad. I'd been really looking forward to the famous Singapore Airlines satay. So I asked if there was any left and Julie received a second starter, which I have to say was well past its best. I'd booked the chef again for this second meal. I'd assumed it would have been the third meal served before landing with a breakfast in the middle, but no. I'd ordered the lamb rack and I'd really been looking forward to it, but it was almost completely inedible. Again, it's probably my fault for asking for it to be served four hours late, but it was so bad that it should have been noticed before it was served. The crew was extremely apologetic and they dug out a curry dish for me to eat instead, which was quite good. I also found a $75 compensation voucher in my inbox which I landed, which was a wonderful touch. I then spent the rest of the flight trying to find a comfortable position to watch movies from whilst everyone around me slept. I was really out of sync with everyone else, but I was really in sync with New York time and felt really good when I arrived. So good in fact that I recorded a video about the process of getting US global entry from the hotel room before I went to bed. Oh, and I should mention the loo, Penhaligon's condiments, a foot pedal to operate the bin lid, which was nice, and some orchids to brighten the environment. It was an airplane loo. And down into a cold New York evening. The world's longest flight can be expensive. This one-way flight would have cost £3,200 from Singapore. But if you start the trip outside of Singapore and connect through en route, the price can drop dramatically. I started in Bangkok and by adding a two and a half hour flight to the trip, I cut the cost by almost two thirds. I paid £1,146 for this trip and as I enjoyed almost 21 hours of flying time, that worked out at £56 an hour. And for a product of Singapore's quality, that's exceptional value. This has been a tricky video to script. I enjoyed the flight and overall, Singapore Airways did a good job of minimising the negative consequences of flying so far. Qantas could save themselves a lot of time and money by hopping on one of these flights to see how it's done. But Singapore's choice of seat is peculiar. It's brilliant if you sit facing straight forward with your feet on the floor, but almost every other position involves some degree of discomfort. There's next to no recline and converting the seat into a bed is a right palaver that no other airline puts their passengers through. Virgin's newer planes have abandoned this approach even though they still have to offer it in their older planes. And Singapore's seat is way behind the curve when it comes to privacy. 
The food was excellent, or would have been, had I eaten to Singapore's schedule rather than mine. The book the chef option on flights leaving Singapore gives you some fantastic options. The in-flight Wi-Fi is brilliant, the entertainment was great and the crew was wonderful. Pyjamas would have been nice, but the bed was comfortable and I slept well. In the unlikely event that I have to do that routing again, I'd happily take that flight again and I'd be better prepared for how Singapore handles it as you now will be having watched this video. But as long as Singapore perseveres with those seats, the door will be ajar for someone to offer something better. And in 2025, we'll see if Qantas does. After 18 hours, we were received with a bus gate, which could have been annoying, but we did get a good look at the plane. And Singapore did provide two buses, so we didn't have to wait for the last premium economy passenger to shuffle off before we headed to the terminal. And we were dropped right at the immigration desks, and I got to use the global entry kiosks for the very first time. And they were brilliant. So thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Please give this video a like if you did. Please leave me a comment, is this a flight you would take or would you prefer to split your journey with an intermediate stop? Please consider subscribing if you're new. And if you'd like to support what I'm doing more directly, there is a Patreon account, the link to which is in the description below. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.